every day ordinary people teach us that democracy is free speech and dissent. For once, we the people <clears throat> stop speaking out and stop dissenting. Once we are distracted or pacified, once we turn away from each other, we are no longer free. For true democracy is the sum, is the sum of our resistance. If you don't speak up, if you give up what is uniquely yours as a human being, if you surrender your consciousness, your independence, your sense of what is right and what is wrong, in other words, perhaps without knowing it, you become passive and controlled, unable to defend yourselves and those you love. People often ask, what can I do? The answer is not so difficult. Learn how the world works. Challenge the statements and intentions of those who seek to control us behind a facade of democracy and monarchy. Unite in common purpose and common principle to design, build, document, finance and defend. Learn, challenge, act now. <laughs> This is my video update from Larnica, Cyprus on this May 7, Sunday, midday. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with a Washington Post article with the title, Senior Ukrainian Officials Fear Counterattack May Not Live Up to Hype. This Washington Post article was published yesterday, May 6, and it has interviews from Elensky and the Ukraine Minister of Defense. And the Ukraine Minister of Defense in this article says that perhaps, just perhaps, this counteroffensive has been hyped up just a bit too much, and the collective West should maybe lower their expectations of the Ukraine military as they prepare to launch this counter attack. The Washington Post says the Ukraine military has spent nearly 15 months exceeding the world's expectations. Now senior, senior leaders are trying to lower those hopes, fearing that the outcome of an imminent counteroffensive aimed at turning the tide of the war with Russia may not live up to the hype. The expectation from our counteroffensive campaign is overestimated in the world, Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov said in an interview this week. Most people are waiting for something huge, he added, which he fears may lead to emotional disappointment. This is the same guy who just two, three days ago promised something huge in, uh, in the next couple of days and weeks. He said something huge is going to happen to a nuclear power plant, to a hydroelectric power plant, something huge is going to happen with the, with the spring, fall, winter, summer counteroffensive. He also said that uh, the only way that Ukraine would negotiate with Russia is once Russia capitulated in full and they had surrendered. This is the guy, the Ukraine Minister of Defense, who said all of this stuff last week, talking all kinds of smack. And now he is coming out and saying, yeah, you know, it's, it's not going to be such a huge counteroffensive and don't get your hopes up, Collective West. Don't get your hopes up. We'll, we'll just do a couple of, uh, of pinprick attacks here and there and, and you know, that, 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 that'll be good. That'll be good. Just don't expect too much from this counteroffensive, man, these guys. Man, these guys, what else uh, does the Washington Post article say? It says the pressure comes in part from Ukraine's past battlefield wins, first repelling Russia's attempt to capture Kiev and later dislodging the invaders from strongholds in surprise attacks in the Kharkiv and Kherson regions. We inspired everywhere because the perception was that we will fall during 72 hours, Reznikov said, but the track record means Ukraine's partners now have a joint expectation that it would be successful again, he said. Western partners have told him, he said, that they now need a next example of success because we need to show it to our people. But I cannot tell you what the scale of this success would be 
10 kilometers, 30 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers. A major success could rally more support for the Western arms and ammunition. Ukraine needs to continue the fight and offer a much needed morale boost for the civilian population, which relished Ukrainian forces' resilience against Russia's efforts to take Kiev last spring and later their surprise autumn offensive in, in the Kharkov region, which retook hundreds of miles of territory in a matter of days. But in Kharkov, the Ukrainians had an advantage when they stormed Russian troops who had lowered their defenses by surprise. Many who remained simply fled without a fight, and in Kherson to the south, Ukraine had a major geographic edge with Russia struggling to supply troops west of the Dnieper River. Now Russia may have the geographic advantage and stronger numbers. Some 500,000 Russian troops are currently focused in Ukraine with at least 300,000 inside Ukrainian territory, Reznikov said. The siege of Kiev. 40,000 troops, Russian troops, expected to take a city of 3 million uh, people. Give me a break. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. Everyone knows that the Russians were trying to force the Alensky regime to the negotiating table so that we didn't have to end up in this conflict, in this war. And it almost worked. It almost worked. Alensky was ready to, uh, to agree to some sort of peace plan, some sort of ceasefire. And then Boris Johnson flew into town and ruined everything. But you know, the, the collective West and the Ukraine military, they trapped themselves in their own propaganda narrative because they decided to go with the lie that there was some siege of Kiev and the lie that there was some great Kherson or Kharkiv counteroffensive. They decided to push this lie, amplify it, go along with it, repeat it a hundred times. Now they've trapped themselves in their own propaganda and they've started to believe the propaganda and now the collective West is coming back to them and they're saying, well, we want another uh, Kharkiv counteroffensive. We want another Kherson counteroffensive. We want another siege of Kiev. If you don't give us another siege of Kiev, well, then we're going to pull our support. And to be, to, to be quite fair, much of the, the high expectations, is, it's not coming from the collective West. It's been Podoliak and Reznikov and Delensky, they're the ones that have been uh, hyping up the counteroffensive more than anybody. They're the ones that for the past three to six months, let's just say the past three months, they've been talking about how they're going to be fishing in Crimea and skinny dipping in Crimea and, and all of this stuff. I mean, you know, every other day they've been issuing statements about how they're going to, to capture all of Crimea, how they're going to capture all of Varonish and how they're going to capture all of uh, Vladivostok and how they're going to, uh, to, to break apart the Russian Federation and, and all of these, these crazy things that they've been talking about over the past three months. And I'm exaggerating a bit of it. I don't think uh, Podoliak said that they're going to take over Vladivostok, but uh, he's pretty much been, been pumping this thing up to insane levels, insane levels. I am going to be fishing in Crimea, he said, pretty much. We're going to be in Crimea and we're going to be fishing in Crimea or swimming in Crimea or whatever, uh, whatever nonsense that guy said. And now they're coming back and they're saying, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe, you know, this is too much hype. Maybe we should lower the expectations a bit because reality is starting to set in. The closer we get to this counteroffensive of which the Ukraine military is being forced to do because the collective West, the neocons, Newland, Sullivan, Blinken, they're saying, we need a counteroffensive. Do it now. And so you have Alensky and Reznikov and Podoliak and all these clowns are sitting there going, crap. Now we have to actually go through with this and it's not going to be this cakewalk that uh, we've been pumping it up to be. It's like the guy that's, that, that mouths off to, to, I don't know, to Mike Tyson. Just, just, you know, talk smack to Mike Tyson, nonstop. Man, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat you up, man, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pummel you, and I'm gonna knock you out, and I'm gonna do all of these things to you, Iron Mike. And then when, when he ha actually has to fight Mike Tyson, he's like, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, hey, Mike, uh, you know, maybe we can take it easy. Maybe, you know, we can just throw a couple of just light punches and we can play around a bit and, and we can just take it slow. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is nonsense, man. This is nonsense. Come on, man. Come on, man, Reznikov. Just a couple of days ago, you were talking so much smack. And now you're telling everybody not to hype it up. Anyway, the article from this Washington Post, uh, from the Washington Post also says that the key objectives of this spring offensive are to sever the land bridge in Crimea and to take over the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. It says those are the big, the big goals. And then it says possibly, the article actually says possibly uh, landing in Crimea, some, some sort of uh, amphibious assault landing into Crimea and actually taking over Crimea as well is a possibility. I mean, that, that is insane. That is insane. But the Washington Post actually throws it out there. It talks about Ukraine's Navy, Ukraine's Navy landing in, uh, in Crimea and taking over uh, Sevastopol and, and Crimea. Just crazy, crazy stuff. So that's the, uh, the Washington Post article trying to think if there's anything else interesting in this in this article which is just really meant to provide some cover for uh for ukraine before this counteroffensive maybe this counteroffensive will succeed maybe it will not succeed maybe it'll take over 10 or 20 kilometers maybe the ukraine military will get pummeled who knows who knows but but you can obviously see that the washington post is is not so optimistic, and now they're actually trying to provide some cover for, uh, for the Alensky regime. That's all they are trying to do. So the Washington Post, they talked about one of the possibilities being some sort of an assault on Crimea with the Ukraine Navy. And we had a statement from Tamila Tasheva, who is the representative of the president of Ukraine in Crimea. And she said, just the other day, she said that after the liberation of Crimea, she will lustrate, evict, and imprison Russians and everyone who collaborated with them. So it looks like uh, Miss Tamila Tasheva, she believes that this counteroffensive is going to be huge. She's talking about about evicting Russians and imprisoning Russians in Crimea. Okay, and she's, she's the representative to the president, to Alensky. Oh boy, I have a feeling that the Ukraine military, the Ukraine uh, elite, the government elite, they've really dug themselves in a big, big hole and uh, they don't know how to get out of it. But we'll see. We will see as this counteroffensive gets underway. There are reports that Ukraine has amassed a good uh, 50,000 troops, mostly in the direction of Zaporozhye. I believe that the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant is what they're going to go after, knowing how much the Alensky regime loves media narratives. I can just see the Alensky regime just looking at their options as far as a counterattack is uh, concerned, and there would be no greater media talking point for Alensky than, uh, than the ZNPP. Outside of Crimea, the ZNPP for Alensky is, is the media talking point, and we know that Crimea is impossible. The ZNPP, they're probably looking at it and they're saying, you know what, this would give us the most media attention, and with media attention, We'll be able to get more money and more weapons. So that's what I believe they're going to go after is the Zaporozhye nuclear power plants. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what, uh, what is going on between Prigozhin, Wagner, the Russian uh, military, and uh, Kadyrov. Kadyrov and the Chechen forces because... 
Prigozhin after he announced that Wagner was going to be exiting from Bakhmut on May 10th, and it would kind of be transitioning to the Russian military, Prigozhin said that he will actually be handing off the, uh, the fighting to Kadyrov. And Prigozhin, he said a lot of other things as well. He came out with quite a few statements the other day. He said, it's better to save an army than to win a battle. Almost 95% of the terrorists have been taken in Artemovsk today, which is Bakhmut. The remaining 5% do not play any role for the development of the campaign further to the West. He said that uh, I have no ambition to remain in history as the man who took the city. I have ambition to help people. And Prigozhin also said that he has or he will get in touch with Kadiros representatives to transfer positions in Bakhmut to Ahmad, to Kadyrov. So, you know what I think is going on here? I think that uh, Kadyrov has been brought into this, whether he brought himself into this, whether Putin called him up and said, can you step in Kadyrov? Whatever is going on, I think Kadyrov has, has inserted himself into this, this fight between this dispute between Wagner and the Russian military, the Russian high command, say Shoigu and Yerasimov, as, as someone who can, who can provide a bit of, I don't want to say mediation, but uh, let's say transition, a calm transition where Prigozhin kind of exits the, the scene. And I'm, I'm speaking mostly from a media angle where Prigozhin kind of fades away like the arc of Prigozhin starts to, starts to go down. The, the story arc of Prigozhin starts to go down. And you could see that in the statement that he made. I think this statement where he says, I have no ambition to remain in history as the man who took the city. I have ambition to help the people. I think that's kind of like Prigozhin's way of saying, my storyline has, is coming to, to a conclusion. I'm not saying that Prigozhin is, is not going to be making statements or, or being a part of of this, uh, of this entire, say, special military operation in one form or another. But I think as far as this chapter, his, his story is going to come to a conclusion and we're going to see a shift now to the, the Russian military along with Wagner because from what I, from what I understand, I saw a video of, uh, of the Russian commander who's going to be taking over in Bakhmut, actually in Bakhmut, kind of surveying what's going on along with the, the Wagner forces. So I saw the Russian uh, um, commander, uh, Minitsev, I believe is his name. He was in Bakhmut taking a look around and preparing to, to take things over. So, so I think Kadyrov is actually very clever. I think Kadyrov is, is going to act as like that transition point where we go from, from Prigozhin to Kadyrov to the Russian military and the Russian military command. And I think it's, it, it, it saves face and provides a nice transition. So it saves, you know, I, I think Prigozhin saves face. I think the Russian military commanders, they save face. And Kadyrov provides that nice kind of, kind of transition to, to the next chapter without having to, to deal with this dispute between Prigozhin and Shoigu and Yerasimov. So I think it's actually very clever that Kadyrov has kind of come into the, the mix here. And you're going to have this handoff to Kadyrov and to, to the Chechen uh, forces, who will then transition over to the, to the Russian military and everything will get smoothed out. So I don't know who came up with this. And this is just my hunch, looking at, at what's going on and, and reading the statement from Prigozhin. I don't know who came up with this, whether it was Kadyrov or Putin or someone else in the Kremlin, but I think this was actually a clever move to, to move Kadyrov into, into this, uh, let's say, this dispute that was going on. Wedge him in there and he can provide that, that transition and, and calm everything down. And I think everyone kind of saves face because this was, without a doubt, if this wasn't acting, if this wasn't theatrics from Prigozhin, then this was, this was a pretty, 
pretty embarrassing event for the, the Russian military and, uh, and the Putin administration because the Putin administration, and I said this before in a video um, that, that I did a couple of days, I said this in that video that the Putin administration that, that I've been covering, that I know, does not like these types of public public statements and these types of videos that go on to social media. They do not like this type of stuff. So that's what's going on with, with the whole Prigozhin, Shoigu, Yerasimov um, dispute storyline. And I think it is coming to an end. And Kadyrov is going to provide that transition to the next chapter. And it does look like the Russian military and the Wagner forces and maybe soon to be Kadyrov, it does look like they're going to make a big push to, to just swallow up the, the remaining 5% of Bakhmut. So that's, uh, that's what's going on there. Prigozhin also said that uh, he was speaking with Surovikin about Bakhmut when, when everything started in the direction of Bakhmut. And he did say that him and Surovikin did plan to, to create an area where they could just swallow up all the Ukraine military and just annihilate it. And Prigozhin is saying that that was the plan all along is to, to create an area where Ukraine would just send um, forces, forces into, this, into this area and they, would, and they would just annihilate those forces. And it looks like that, uh, that this worked and there's 5% left of Bakhmut, so let's Let's finish it up and move on. That was kind of what Prigozhin said in another statement. So we also had, uh, yesterday, we had a huge missile, uh, a, a missile drone a glider bomb, I believe, uh, strike throughout all of, of Ukraine. I think Odessa, from what I've been reading, uh, Odessa got hit uh, very hard, at least military facilities and weapons depots in Odessa got completely smashed. Uh, there were missile strikes and, and bombs that hit uh, Nikolaev and even in Kiev and basically all throughout uh, Ukraine. So that was, a, that was a big story that took, that took place yesterday. The Russian military continues to, to degrade and destroy whatever facilities uh, Ukraine has or that Ukraine is planning to, to use as they prepare to launch the, the counteroffensive. So we had that happen and yesterday we also had another terrorist attack where a group known as Atesh, a Ukraine terrorist group, which from what I understand has some sort of funding or backing by the SBU, they, uh, they tried to assassinate Russian writer and journalist, as well as politician, Zakhar uh, Prilepin. And uh, from what I understand, uh, Prilepin was, uh, not only is he um, an incredibly talented, famous writer, he's also a journalist and he also served in politics, but he also is, uh, is someone who served in the military for Donbass, and he also served in, uh, in this conflict as well. And from what I understand, he was recently in Donbass, and these Atesh guys, they started to, to follow him. And as he was driving into the area of Nizhny Novgorod in Russia, his car uh, blew up. So they put an explosive underneath his car, and it blew up. He was actually, from what I, from what I read, he was even with his daughter and his assistant, his assistant, who was driving the automobile, uh, he died. His daughter, from what I read, actually, like the car stopped and his daughter got out of the car to, to do something or go somewhere. And that's when the car uh, exploded. At least this is what I've read. But um, Prilepin actually survived. And at one point he was in critical condition. And the last reports that I've read via telegram, so I, I can't confirm this 100%, is that he is now conscious and it looks like he's, in, he's now in stable condition. But once again, I can't confirm that 100%. I just read that like five minutes before I did this video. But from what I understand, uh, Prilepin 
will, uh, looks like he will pull out of this, this terrorist uh, assassination attempt. So, so in the past like week or so, we've had the Ukraine SPU or military, they've hit oil depots in Crimea, they've, they've derailed trains in, uh, in Bryansk, they tried to assassinate the Russian president and they sent drones into the Kremlin and now they've gone after a writer, journalist and politician in Zakhar Prilepin. So the terrorist activities from, uh, from Ukraine and from groups like this Atesh are definitely ramping up. They are definitely ramping up and I expect they will continue to ramp up the closer we get to the counteroffensive, to the launch of the counteroffensive. And all of this is being done to create fear and panic in, uh, in Russian society and, of course, with the goal of creating some sort of uh, uh, crisis and confidence in the Putin government and the ultimate goal of some sort of regime change. So in Poland, we have the Polish government demanding that the EU place sanctions on the import of Russian agricultural products. Poland wants to ban all Russian agricultural products from entering the European Union. Why not? Why not? <laughs> you might as well just ban it all. Just ban everything from entering the European Union because then the agricultural products will be sold to, I don't know, to India and then the, the agricultural products could be sold back to Poland at 10 times the price. I don't know. Why not? <laughs> why not? I mean, you're paying 10 times more for, uh, for Russian fuel and gas, so you might as well pay 10 times more for Russian wheat. Sure. <laughs> sure. Good idea. Uh, Polish government. Very good idea. The European Union, they are uh, planning their, I believe it's, is it their 11th sanctions package or their 12th sanctions package? I've kind of lost count by now. Anyway, I think it's the 11th sanctions package. And uh, they are preparing the sanction package, the sanctions package. And from what I understand, the plan of this package is going to be to target the export of EU products to countries that then import these EU products to Russia. So they're going to be looking to ban EU member states from exporting their products to countries that the EU believes are countries that then sell these EU products into Russia. So that's going to be the, the goal of the 11th or 12th or 28th EU sanctions package. Oh boy, they are going to hurt a whole lot of businesses in the European Union with this next sanctions package. And that's what's going to be happening from here on out. The EU, they have failed in uh, destroying the Russian economy with their targeted sanctions at Russia. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to... They're gonna, uh, just eat their own, I guess is the, is the phrase that, that I'm looking for. They're just going to start sanctioning their own businesses and their own people in order to, to somehow destroy Russia. This is, this is the madness, the madness of Wandercrazy. <laughs> oh, it's not going to turn out well for the European Union, that's for sure. But, you know, they don't care. The EU doesn't care. They'll, they'll gladly destroy themselves if it means they can destroy Russia. Talking about destroying themselves, this is a story that I wanted to talk about actually uh, a couple of days ago, but I just couldn't quite fit it in to one of my videos. It didn't fit into the, the flow of one of my videos, but uh, I think it fits in nicely with this video, and that is the, the fact that the EU and this is a couple of days ago that this happened, the EU has decided to back the Dutch scheme to forcibly shut down thousands of farms and ban farmers from returning to agriculture forever. Forever. 
the European Commun C Commission in Brussels has backed a scheme by the globalist government of Prime Minister Mark Rutte in the Netherlands that would see thousands of farms shut down in order to comply with EU climate goals. So on Tuesday, last Tuesday, the government arm of the European Union officially threw its support behind plans by the Dutch government to buy out thousands of farmers from their land in order to meet the EU's Natura, Natura 2000 scheme to protect certain environments. The plan, which would offer farmers 120% of the value of their farm, could see some 3,000 so-called peak emitters of nitrogen shut down. Let's see, there's some quote here from an EU official. That's pretty, pretty shocking. Let me find it here. It was unclear before this week whether the EU would permit such a scheme as it could have potentially fallen afoul of regulations surrounding state aid or subsidies. However, Brussels said that the plans were necessary and appropriate. That's the quote. The plans were necessary and appropriate as they met the broader goals of the European Green Deal. The positive effects transcend any distortions of the free market, the statement said. The positive effects transcend any distortions of the free market, the statement added. What positive effects are they talking about? Boy, these people are absolutely freaking insane. And from what I understand, in this buyout plan, the farmers are not going to be allowed to return to farming ever, ever. Like in the EU, they will be banned from farming for life. For life. Their entire profession, everything that they've known, everything that they've, they've been working at to, to feed themselves, their families, to, to provide for the, for the community, they won't be allowed to do it for life. Absolutely insane. I mean, absolutely insane. And if they don't agree to the 120% buyout, I think the, the Rute government is just going to confiscate the land. So they really have no choice. So they have to take these, these 30 pieces of silver and, and betray everything they know. And they have to live with it forever. That is the definition of evil. That is the definition of evil. So we'll give you 120% of your land and you can never farm again. You can never farm again. And the EU has now said that they absolutely back this scheme. Because, well, the Great Reset, the European Green New Deal, that's what this is all about. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. In addition to the plan to buy out or eventually force out if they refuse the peak emitting farms, the government is also planning a separate scheme that would give dairy pig and poultry farmers a deal for 100% of the value of their farm if they wished to shut down. In total, some 1.4 billion euros is expected to be set aside for both farm shutdown schemes. Amazing stuff, scary stuff, absolutely scary stuff. I'm just looking through this article to see where I read that the farmers will be prohibited from farming for life. From uh, Eva Vlardingerbroek, the EU has given the Dutch government the green light buy out 3,000 Dutch farmers, offering them 120% of the market value, incentivizing them to sell voluntarily. If they don't, they'll be expropriated later. Oh, and they won't be allowed to start over elsewhere in the EU. Very interesting tweet from Eva. Well, I know where Dutch farmers can go to farm. And I know a country that would gladly, gladly accept them. That country is Russia. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, 
let's do a couple of clown worlds and uh, and wrap this up. I saw a headline this morning from the Telegraph of all publications, the Telegraph. Over 2,000 U.S. banks are insolvent. Almost half of the 4,800 banks in the U.S. are nearly insolvent as they have burned through their capital buffers. The Telegraph reported earlier this week, citing a group of banking experts. Let's not pretend that this is just about Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, said Professor Amit Seru, a banking expert at Stanford University. University. A lot of the U.S. banking system is potentially insolvent. But look, look, a balloon, a balloon, a Chinese balloon there. And there, <laughs> and there. Don't look at the banking crisis. Look at the balloons. Look at the balloons, those Chinese balloons. Wow. And I thought it was 200 banks. Like a couple of months ago, it was 200 banks looking solvent. Now, 2,000? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So, two clown worlds. And which clown world should I start off with? Because... Both of them are equally good. How about Prince Charles III's Great Reset coronation that happened uh, yesterday? And in attendance for this coronation was Jill Biden, the First Lady, and her granddaughter. I believe her granddaughter. I forgot her granddaughter's name. First Lady Jill Biden, Jill Biden attended the King's coronation Saturday alongside her granddaughter, Finnegan Biden, 23. And they attended the coronation in Ukrainian colors. <laughs> so Jill, ba Jill Biden, Dr. Dr. Jill Biden, excuse me, she, uh, she wore uh, a blue dress and her granddaughter wore a yellow dress so that they can show their support for Ukraine. And Biden actually tweeted, we stand with Ukraine a day before the coronation. <laughs> These people, man. These people are cuckoo for Cocoa Pops, man. Cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. <laughs> oh, man. Man, oh, man. So she was wearing a blue dress. Her granddaughter was wearing a yellow dress. And... And they said, we stand for Ukraine as they attend the coronation of Prince Charles III. It, it, it's clown world, but to be quite honest, it actually makes a lot of sense. Because Ukraine, Alensky, I've been saying Alensky is the avatar of globalism forever now. He is the avatar, the representation of globalism. That's why you have to go to Kiev and bow down to Alensky. It's not so much that you're bowing down to Alensky or giving money to Alensky, paying tribute to Alensky, what you're doing is you're, you're giving money and bowing down to globalism, the Great Reset, uh, the neoliberal uh, world order, Klaus Schwab, George Soros, whatever, uh, the neocons, that's, that, that's, that's what you're doing when you visit Alensky. You're showing that, that you're, you're, you're a subject to, to this ideology, to this religion. That's why you go to Alensky. You, you show your... your uh, your faith in this globalist ideology. You prove it, that you're one of the believers. And so the fact that we had the Great Reset coronation of Prince Charles III, the, the globalist king of, uh, of England, we, we had his coronation. It's kind of fitting that, that Dr. Jill Biden and her granddaughter would be wearing the, the colors of the Ukraine flag because Ukraine is, is symbolic of of the fight between the globalists and, and the new multipolar uh, system. So, yeah, it, it does kind of make sense in a, strange, in a strange way, I have to admit. And let's do our final clown world. And this one's, uh, this one's a good one. <laughs> this one's a really good one. I thought, so, so I thought that uh, this story was not true. And that's why I, uh, I did not report on this, because this is a story from May 4th. And I thought it was a joke. I thought it was, you know, the Babylon Bee or, or something like that. And uh, it turns out that 
This is not a joke. And this is not the Babylon B. <laughs> this is real, everybody. This is absolutely real. And let's just take the, the title from Breitbart. Let me read it out to everyone. Kamala Harris, Harris named AI czar to save us from artificial intelligence. Kamala Harris has been named the artificial intelligence czar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the com. We are on <laughs> Rumble, Odyssey, Big Shoot, and uh, Telegram, and uh, go to the Durant shop. 10% off. Use the code <laughs> good day. The AI czar Kamala Harris. Oh boy. All right, everybody, take care. So I think it's very important, as you have heard from so many incredible leaders, for us at every moment in time, and certainly this one, to see the moment in time in which we exist and are present, and to be able to contextualize it, to understand where we exist in the history and in the moment as it relates not only to the past but the future.